tactical weapon. At the beginning of the 13th century, the militaristic Edward I wanted to make a grand statement about the elevated nature of kingship. He created an iconic object that's been at the centre of British life for 800 years, last used during Elizabeth II's coronation. Edward's coronation chair, which has crowned monarchs since the Middle Ages, recently underwent restoration in Westminster Abbey by the conservator Marie-Louise Sowerberg. We made a studio on site for the coronation chair um, to treat it, to stabilize it, is basically the headline of what we're doing. We have had to um, mend the seat. There was a couple of fractures in it. Um, some old repairs that we redid, so we were sure that they were stronger than they were before. The chair has received a battering since its creation. The Victorians tried to tone down its gilding through varnishing it brown. It was bombed by suffragettes. And most visible of all, the chair's covered with centuries-old graffiti. There's something like 300 initials and names carved into the chair. All this graffiti is mainly Westminster schoolboys and they are mainly 18th century inscriptions. We've got one here, a P. Abbott, who slept in the chair one night in July in 1800, spending probably more time, well, definitely more time than any monarch ever spent in the chair. It's said that if you paid a shilling, you could scratch your name into it. A lot of these scratches here are probably pen mice, people taking little pieces of the chair to have and to hold, to eat, who knows, it could have had sort of... Yeah, I think it has sort of mystic powers still. One of the earliest monarchs to receive his coronation on the chair was Richard II in the late 14th century. The moment was captured in this painting, commissioned by Richard himself the first accurate likeness of an English monarch. Richard was the first king to insist on being the sole ruler in the kingdom, with the nobility obeying him absolutely. He demanded to be called Royal Majesty, a new invention, and for his subjects to bow the knee in his presence. But he made his greatest statements about his belief in his omnipotence through art. This is the Wilton Diptych. It was a portable altarpiece commissioned by Richard, painted on Baltic oak. It was Richard's attempt to show he was anointed to rule by God himself. Here you see Richard receiving the flag of England from an angel before Jesus and Mary. All of the angels are wearing Richard's emblem, a white heart. And angels were to play a special role in the signature artwork of his reign. In 1393, Richard's master carpenter, Hugh Herland, sailed 660 tons of oak down the Thames in great barges from Surrey. This wood was to be used to remodel Richard's palace at Westminster. The result has been called the greatest work of art of the Middle Ages. A magnificent freestanding roof decorated with angels. The span of that roof is 
over 60 feet, and there simply weren't oak timbers that could span that space. What Hugh Herland did instead was created a kind of joisting structure that allowed the roof to be covered in two stages. It's a structure called a hammer beam. Once it had been created in this form and ornamented with angels, the English public was clearly dazzled by it. Each of the principal trusses of the roof is carved with a figure of an angel holding the royal arms. And symbolically, there are 13 trusses, which is the number of Christ and his apostles. Here, in this wonderful architectural metaphor, the heavenly court of Christ hovers in appreciation and protection over its earthly counterpart, the court of Richard II. The increasing ambitions of the monarchs inevitably led to battles with the other power in the land, the church. The uneasy relationship between the two unraveled in the 16th century under the reign of King Henry VIII. Henry saw the wealth and influence of the Catholic Church in Rome as an obstruction to his own power. He was the first monarch to declare that he should be the head of the Church of England. And this schism is all revealed in one remarkable object. In the 1530s, Henry commissioned this oak rood screen as a gift for the chapel at King's College. In a break with tradition, it was carved in the continental Renaissance style. It's less a religious object than an unashamed attempt to project the power of the monarch. It contains not just the initials of Henry VIII, Henricus Rex. It also has the name of his wife, Anne Boleyn, Regina Anne. And it's covered with images of military might rather than saints. This was one of the last rood screens to be erected in Britain. The effect of the union of Henry and Anne unleashed the turmoil of the Reformation and the many wonders created by woodworkers over the centuries were now about to be destroyed. The religious revolutions of the 16th and 17th centuries finally brought an end to the golden age of religious oak carving. And oak was now looking very old-fashioned as carvers turned to other woods as Britain's cultural horizons expanded. Grinling Gibbons, the greatest carver ever to work in these islands, rejected oak for the far suppler lime wood in the 17th century and in the 18th century, craftsmen like Thomas Chippendale used mahogany from the West Indies. But at the turn of the 20th century, one man was to revive the lost art of oak carving. Robert Thompson was a craftsman who was obsessed with the Middle Ages. Based in the tiny Yorkshire village of Kilburn, he wanted to turn the clock back to before the Reformation, bringing fine oak carving back into churches. But Robert also introduced a delightful twist that would capture people's imaginations. He was to become famous in Britain and across the world as the Mouseman of Kilburn. The Thompson family business is still thriving and keeps faith with Robert's vision of handcrafted medieval-style workmanship. 
but always at its center, is the legendary figure of the mouse. Great grandfather was working with a fellow craftsman, and they were working on a local church. And the craftsman happened to mention he thought they were both as poor as church mice. And of course, the church mouse is working away with its chisel like teeth, and nobody knows he's there. So he thought how nice it would be to carve the mouse on this particular piece he was working on. So ever since that day, each piece that we've produced here at Kilburn has had a mouse carved on it. Each mouse is carved by the craftsman who makes a piece of furniture. So each one is identifiable. So we've got 25 craftsmen, so basically we have 25 different styles of mice. So we can each identify each other's work. We're in a world of mass production and unfortunately, you know, things have moved on at such a, a great rate of knots. There is still room for the small family business, still using the traditional craft skills. We're not mass production, we're hands-on. You know, there's no substitute for a pair of those at the end of the day. The wonders of the Middle Ages can still be glimpsed in our churches and museums. Such was the violence of the destruction in the 16th and 17th centuries. It can only ever be a small taste of this lost world. But one final object shows that this type of religious art still holds a ghostly presence. In the 16th century, this church was attacked by Protestant reformers. Its lavishly decorated rood screen was whitewashed and painted over with passages from the Bible. Yet, over the centuries, something remarkable happened the faces of Jesus and the saints began to bleed through again. It shows that just beneath the surface, maybe more treasures of the Middle Ages are waiting to be resurrected. And after such breathtaking beauty created hundreds of years ago, we move to the present day and three blokes taking your breath away for other reasons. It's Top Gear, a new series on BBC HD Next. Mm -hmm.